everybody? All right, good to be in the house of the Lord. We are going to be in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. So if you want to turn there, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. We've been talking about the resurrection. We, we got as far as uh, verse 34 last week, and we'll do uh, 35 through 58, finish the chapter this week. So much good stuff in there. I, I didn't want to try to pack it all into one sermon. Um, last week, we looked into uh, the, the, the power of the gospel. And, and what is the power of the gospel? It's the resurrection. The resurrection, you know, like many times, you know, we're out there and we're sharing the love of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we're saying to people, listen, Jesus died for your sins on the cross, he paid the price, and if you repent of your sins and ask him to forgive you and to save you, you'll have eternal life. And that's true, that's good, but that's a partial gospel. The full gospel is sharing the death, the burial, and the resurrection, because what Paul was showing us last week, that without the resurrection, we got nothing. We got no hope. And somehow, this message had crept into the Corinthian church that there was no resurrection. The Epicureans in that day had a thought, that a belief that there was no afterlife. So just eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And this had crept into the Corinthian church, and Paul had to come in and correct them and say, listen, when I came to you, I teach the death, the burial, the resurrection, and you received it, and you were saved. How is it that you're now ad adhering to this false teaching of there's no resurrection? And he said, listen, he gave facts. He said, Jesus died according to the scriptures for our sins. Jesus rose on the third day. Uh, from the dead, according to the scriptures. And then he went on to present over 500 people that he could march through a courtroom to testify of eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection. He said he, that he had seen him himself after the resurrection. And so he says, how is it that you teach that there's no resurrection? If there's no resurrection, we might as well just pack it up and go home. We, our preaching's in vain. Um, you know, all that gathering together in his name is in vain. We're still dead in our sins if there's no resurrection. And all those that died supposedly in Jesus, they perished. So the importance of us teaching the resurrection, because without the resurrection, we have no hope. The fact that we know that the Father accepted the sacrifice on the cross of Jesus Christ to give his life, to pour out his blood for you and me, that the fact that we know that he accepted it is the very resurrection itself. And Jesus rose from the dead, the first to rise from the dead, never to die again. And there is more historic fact on the resurrection of Jesus Christ than any other event in history. It's a real deal. That's why we're here today, to give God our first fruits, to gather in his name. For in Adam we all died, even so in Christ shall we all be made alive. Sin entered in through, through one man. And that's why we were born into sin. And so God did the impossible, the unthinkable, to come down for, from glory, to die on the cross, to be killed by his own creation, to die for their sins, that we could have eternal life. And how beautiful and wonderful is that? Paul said that, you know, if there's no resurrection, why am I putting my life on the line every single day? You know Paul's life. Everywhere he went. He got beaten, he got thrown in prison, he got rocked, he got chased out of town. He said, why would I be doing all this if there wasn't a resurrection? You know there was a resurrection. He says, I'm out there serving the Lord while you're just partying it up, Corinthians. Or you're partying all week and then you're coming in and you're saying to Jesus, oh, praise God, hallelujah. But you don't believe in a resurrection, you have no hope. I'm out there putting my life on the line, Paul says. And in order for us to put our life on the line, in order for us to live for Jesus to the fullest, we have to die to ourselves. Paul said, I die daily. Romans 12 says to present yourself a living sacrifice unto God. See, the difference between a living sacrifice and a dead sacrifice is that 
a dead sacrifice doesn't crawl off the altar. But you know, one day we could be just so living for God on fire, and I, was, man, I, I died to myself yesterday. Yeah, but are you going to die to yourself today? He talks about the resurrection, and I want you to understand, whenever he talks about the resurrection, he's talking about the bodily resurrection, this physical frame. That we know that when people die in Christ, they go to be with the Lord, but we know this body stays behind. It's, it's what's buried. It's what's cremated. It's what's poured out in the ocean as a memorial when we, when we celebrate someone going home to be with the Lord. But one day, this body will be resurrected. And joined to us once again, raised incorruptible. He says, otherwise, if Jesus didn't rise, everything we're doing is in vain. But let me just tell you, it's not because he rose. And guess what? You're going to heaven. You got eternal life because you've put your trust in Jesus. You didn't put your trust in this world. This world will let you down. Jesus will never let you down. And then he warns us in verse 33, be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. And what he was saying there was, listen guys, you've allowed these false teachers to come in and teach you false doctrines, and they have corrupted you. And just like he's saying to the Corinthian church here, he's also saying to you, to me, if you hang out with those that are doing evil, it won't be long before you're doing evil too. He says, awake unto righteousness, sin not, for some have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Some have not the knowledge of God. He says, I speak this to your shame. In John 3.16, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I want you to understand, if you have given your life to Jesus Christ, you will not obtain everlasting life one day. You have it now. So when you pass off this world, it's just, it's just a blink. It's a, it's, it's a close of the eyes. Up, oh, Jesus. In verse 35, he says, but some men will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Now, they're not interested in hearing what Paul has to say right here. You might say, well, that sounds pretty sincere. They're just wondering how it all happens. But actually what they're doing is they're mocking him. What they're really saying is, how are the dead raised up? And what body is going to come out of this? How do I know they're mocking him? Because look at verse 36. Thou fool. That which thou sowest is not quickened except it die." And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not the body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. And so what he's saying here is that he's saying, you guys, listen, even nature testifies of a resurrection. Even nature, when you plant a seed, that farmer understands resurrection, the fact that when you plant a seed, a harvest is going to follow. And when you plant that little ugly seed, you don't get back a seed. You get back a beautiful flower. You get back vegetables. You get back a huge tree. It's this transformation, it changes from something ugly to something beautiful. And so he says, even nature, even a farmer understands the resurrection. Why don't you guys? You know, it's interesting that they found grains of wheat in the pyramids that are like four or 5,000 years old, ancient Egyptian pyramids, and they took some of that grain, they put it in the dirt, they added water, and it sprouted. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that I mean, it blows me away. How does that seed know? I mean, 4,000 years later, placed, buried, dead, in the dirt, water. Water is a symbol of the Spirit. Poured onto it, and all of a sudden, it knows to germinate 
and it understands which way is down and which way is up. And the root goes down and the sprout comes up. And it's raised in something more glorious than what it began. In John 12, 24, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. The transformation of a dead seed buried, bringing forth something amazing. Something far more glorious <clears throat> than the seed that was planted. Now ladies, when you get to heaven, and you're hanging out with some of your friends from church there, and you look over and you go, oh my goodness, who is that gorgeous creature with the thick wavy hair? They'll say, that's your husband. Because he's going to be raised in a new glorious body. You know, another example is the butterfly, the caterpillar. Caterpillar, just an ugly worm crawling around on the ground. But then one day, something in it tells it to, to climb high, as high as it can go, and spin itself into a cocoon, giving the appearance of death and being buried in a tomb. And then all of a sudden, one day, it cracks open, and what comes forth? A worm? No. A butterfly. A beautiful butterfly that once was a worm that crawled on this earth, but now is something glorious that flies through the heavens. Even nature cries out of a resurrection. Verse 39. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh, flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another fishes, and another of birds. Interesting. Paul understood there was nothing about evolution there. There is no such thing as evolution. He says right there, verifying what happened in Genesis, that God created everything separately, and everything produces after its own kind. Evolution is a joke, it's a false teaching, and I think they're realizing how ridiculous, ridiculous it is even more today than they did back when I was growing up. Paul states here clearly that not all flesh is the same. The flesh of men is one kind of flesh. The flesh of animals is another kind of flesh. The flesh of fish is different, and the flesh of birds is different. He says in verse 40, there are celestial bodies, and bodies terrestrial. What does that mean? Celestial means heavenly bodies. And then terrestrial means earthly bodies. But the glory of the celestial, the heavenly, is one. And the glory of the terrestrial, the earthy, is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. Are you grabbing onto that? You ever looked up in the skies and see how many stars there are? Every one is different. Now, i got to say something to you. They only discovered that. Scientists only discovered that about 40 years ago. When I was about 20, they used a spectroscope and discovered that every star they looked at had a different spectrum of light and was unique and differed from every other star. How did Paul know this 2,000 years ago? What book was he reading? Let's just take our galaxy. In the universe, they don't even know how big the universe is. The universe is growing. It's massive. They don't, there's, there's all, I, can, I don't even know how many galaxies there are in our universe. But let's just take our galaxy, the Milky Way, and take a look at it for a minute. And it has over 100,000 million stars. And if you were to count them one per second, it would take you 2,500 years to count them. The nearest star that we see, the light that shines, is a light that was sent at the speed of 186,000 miles per second. That's the speed of light. 
186,000 miles per second. So the light that you see when you look up in the sky of the nearest star, the closest star to us, was a light that was sent at 186,000 miles per second. And the light that you are actually seeing today of that nearest star was a light that was sent when Abraham and Sarah walked the face of the earth. Verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness and raised in power. How cool is that? We'll be raised incorruptible. We were we were sown in dishonor, but will be raised in glory and with power. Philippians 3.20 says this, Our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now what does that mean? That means our new glorified body is going to be sick. Remember Jesus? Jesus could just appear and disappear. Remember when he just walked through the wall where the guys were posted up on the evening of the resurrection, freaked them all out? They thought he was a ghost, but he said, hey, touch me. I'm real. Spirit doesn't have flesh and bone. He'd just pop in on the road of Emmaus. He'd just pop in down at the beach and cook some breakfast. He'd just pop in, pop out. We're going to be able to do that. We're going to be moving faster than the speed of light when we want to go somewhere. It's going to be the speed of thought. We're going to be able to fly. We're going to be able to have that same kind of body that he did. We are going to be able to eat food and not gain a pound. Verse 44, it says, Speaking of our bodies, it is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written that the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, but the last Adam, speaking of Jesus Christ, was made a quickening spirit. How be it that was not first which is spiritual, but that which was natural, and afterwards that which is spiritual? The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man, the second Adam, the last Adam, is the Lord from heaven. As the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have born, have been born in the image of the earthy, we shall also bear or grow into the image of the Of the heavenly. That's good news. That's real good news. So, what Paul is saying here is that there are two fountainhead groups of people those who have come from Adam, those who were born earthy, born of Adam, and those who are heavenly, who are born again of Jesus Christ. All men, all women are born of Adam, earthy. But not all are born again of Jesus Christ, heavenly. You must repent of your sins and ask Jesus into your life. He will forgive you and believe that he died on the cross, was buried for you, and rose on the third day. And you will have everlasting life today, right now. See, because of Adam's sin, we were all born into sin. 
How do we know that we're all connected to Adam? You know, it's funny because sometimes I get into these debates with, with people and I start telling them about the Lord and I tell them about creation. They ask these questions. You try to answer their questions. And they say, yeah, 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 I know that whole little cute story about the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve. And yeah, I'm just not buying it. Prove to me that we're all connected to Adam. And you know what I'll say? Here's the proof. We all die. That's the proof. And because Adam sinned, we were all born into sin and we all fall short of the glory of God. So you might say, well, wait a minute, that's not fair. I wasn't even there. That's his mess up. Why am I paying for it? But here's the good news. God is just. He is righteous and holy, full of love and mercy. And so what he did at the cross, dying for our sins, to make a way for something that we didn't do, that Adam did. In other words, you were no more responsible for what Adam did in the garden as you were responsible for what Jesus did on the cross. You say, well, I wasn't there. Adam screwed up. That's not my fault. Okay, Jesus paid a price, and you had nothing to do with that either. Just bring yourself to Jesus. Repent. And ask him to save you. You need to do that. In verse 50, he says this. He says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Wow, this is a powerful verse right here. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Leviticus 17.11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. When Adam sinned, he saw himself for who he really was, naked, a sinner, and he hid himself. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, but flesh and bone can. When Jesus, on the night of the resurrection, came in through the room to the disciples, they thought he was a ghost. He said, touch me. Does the spirit have flesh and bone? Notice he didn't say flesh and blood. Why? His blood was poured out on the cross. His blood was the price. He died for our sins. The final sacrifice once and for all. No need for sacrifices again. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, but flesh and bone can. When Adam was in the garden and God brought him Eve, remember Adam had been naming all the animals, object lesson, Mr. and Mrs. Lion, Mr. and Mrs. Tiger. Then he realized there was no Mrs. Adams for the Adams family. And there's an old running joke that he might have said to God, you know, I noticed I don't have anybody. I'd like to have a, a, a helpmate. And, and God said, well, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. And he said, well, what can I get for a rib? <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. That's not really in, in the book. But we know that God put Adam in a deep sleep. Adam was formed out of the dust of the earth. And the same elements that make up dirt make up you. But Eve wasn't taken from the dust. She was taken from Adam. God put him in a deep sleep, removed a rib, and made Eve. And when he brought Eve to Adam, Adam said, oh my goodness, whoa, man. She is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. But notice he didn't say blood of my blood. Because I believe that Adam and Eve were clothed in light, they walked with God, they were spirit-driven until sin entered in. And then the light went out, and no longer spirit-driven, but now carbon-driven by blood. <coughs> Excuse me, I don't have COVID. I've got an abused vocal cord that plagues me. When Moses went up on the mountain, 
to receive the Ten Commandments. He was up there 40 days and 40 nights, no food or water. That's death. You can go 40 days without food, but not water. And remember, he came down with the Ten Commandments, and he saw the children of Israel in folly. He broke the Ten Commandments, and he went back up for another 40 days. He was up there 80 days with no food and water. It says the Lord sustained him. Something else was driving him. Because when he came down, he glowed. And you and I are one day going to have a body that's not carbon-driven by blood, but spirit-driven. And it's going to be glorious and powerful and incorruptible, and you will not be able to sin in heaven. Right? That's good news. Because that was one of the things that worried me, that I would get up there and, boy, within a day, I'd blow it and be kicked out. But we are going to be like him. It's a beautiful thing. Now, Paul, anticipating that the next question they're going to act, well, ask is, well, if, if Christ returns and the dead are resurrected, what happens to the living? Look at verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all die, but we shall all be changed in the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. That's the good news. Jesus is coming for his bride and if we are alive and remain, we will be caught up in the clouds with him. Let me read you another account of that from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Paul says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which have died in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not proceed them which are, are asleep or dead. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words." Are you ready for that? I'm so ready for that. I don't know about you, but I'm looking around at this world, and it is nutty. And the only reason we're still here is because people still need to be saved. So we looked at that, and the next question for you and me is, so when's that going to happen? When's the rapture going to happen? No man knows the hour of the day, but we know the seasons, and we know that we're really close. So when is it going to happen? It's going to happen in a moment that you think not. If I said to you today, you know, I think Jesus is coming today, you go, oh, well, that'd be nice, but, you know, I really don't believe that. How about if I said Jesus is coming this week? You kind of, yeah, maybe. We, we kind of accept, like, I think he'll come in my lifetime. That's something that sits with us a little bit better. But he's going to come at a moment that you think not, and where will he find you when he comes? Are you watching the sky and ready to fly? Do you wake up every morning going, is today today, Lord? Because if you do, there's this urgency on your heart to get the gospel out. Because you know we're running out of time. If Jesus told us he was coming next Friday, what would we be doing for the next six days? We'd up our game, guaranteed. We'd love people. We'd forgive we probably give all our money away, too. Let me help you out, bro. Jesus loves you. But he's going to come in a moment that you think not. You remember the parable of the ten virgins? Only five had oil in their lamp. It's a picture of the Holy Spirit. That even though there was ten that looked like believers, only five were really believers. Did you know that coming to church doesn't save you? 
no more than you're a car because you sleep in a garage. You're only saved by asking for forgiveness of your sins and asking Jesus into your life. But in the parable of the ten virgins, what happened was only five had oil, but they had to be awakened. They were asleep. So the idea that you could love Jesus, you could be serving Jesus and not be aware of when he comes. You could be found asleep. How great would it be for Jesus to come for us right now? In church, I mean, come on. Is this, this is probably the best place you want to have him find you, right? Speaking properly, being nice and courteous, polite, acting like humans. And if he came right now during the service, I think that would be awesome for most of us. Some of us might have to be awakened. I know that every week there's certain people that are asleep during the service. And I don't take any offense to it because I know I have the gift of putting people to sleep. But, and I know they work hard and I'd rather have them in here asleep during the service. God gives his beloved rest. I, you know, better here than somewhere else. All I ask is that if you're someone that sleeps during the service, don't fake it when you wake up. Because, you know, I'm up here, I see everything. I start to see the bobblehead. And then what happens is when I get a little excited and my voice gets a little bit louder, they wake up and they act like they were looking down at their Bible and they, then they go, Amen. <laughs> Do me a favor, don't fake it. Just whatever. The funniest thing happened once was there was a guy, he slept through the whole service, and as, when the service was over, I was saying goodbye to people and saying, you know, good to see you, have a great day. He comes up to me, and he goes, Pastor, that was a great message. And I'm like, what part did you like? I'm incurable. Pray for me. But, I mean, so when is the Lord coming? Well, it says here in the last trump. And some people go, ah, ah, there it is, the last trump. That's Revelation 8 through 11. It talks about, oh, the, the trumpet judgments, the two witnesses dying, the Lord telling the, the two witnesses to come up here. That's got, no, that's not it. We're not going through the tribulation. Use your head, read your scriptures. The trumpet judgments are spoken of woes. Woe, woe, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth. We just read in Thessalonians where he said comfort one another with these words. He didn't say it was a woe. He said it was a comfort. And the trumpet judgments are blown by angels, not God. And the last trumpet judgment is a trumpet that's blown for days. This one happens in a moment. So then somebody else might say, oh, well, then, ups, it's Matthew 24. The church is going through the whole tribulation because Matthew 24, when Jesus told his disciples about the tribulation, he said at the end that the trumpet would be blown and he would gather from the four corners of the earth his elect. Um, no. The elect is Israel. He will gather Israel from the four corners of the earth at the end of the tribulation. Once again, trumpets blown by angels, not by God. Just read, your, read the scriptures. It makes it really clear. There's only two trumps of God mentioned in the Bible. One in Exodus 19 and the other one mentioned in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Two. Now that's interesting because check this out. In Numbers 10, God tells Moses to fashion two trumpets. Doesn't God always give us like a type of something greater that's coming? When Abraham and Isaac went up the mountain with the wood on the back, it was a type of the father and the son carrying the cross, going willingly. He tells Moses to fashion two trumpets, and they're out of silver. What's silver? The metal of redemption. The first one is to be blown to say to the people, hey, gather together. You're going to receive information. The second one is blown saying, let's move it out. Wars to follow. Wrath's coming. So one for the gathering information, the other one, let's get out of here, wrath is coming. 
in Exodus 19, God comes to Moses and he says, listen, go get the people ready. They're going to meet me. How's that? Can you imagine if God said, Steve, get Calvary Chapel North Shore ready. They're going to meet God. So for three days they prepare. And on that day, they meet, they come to the, 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 to the base of the mountain. And it says the mountain was filled with smoke and lightning. And God descended like in a fire. He's like the fire of God. And the earth was quaking. And, and his voice was exceedingly loud like a trumpet. And they were so freaked out, they said, Moses, we don't want to meet with God anymore. You meet with God and tell us what he says. And I find that too often in the church today. Pastor, you go find out what God says, and then you just let us know. No, you need to dig in the scriptures. The people were so freaked out, they said, we don't want anything to do with it. That was the first trump of God. The last trump of God is in Thessalonians and what's happening in Corinthians, the rapture of the church, the last trump, the trump of God. The first trumpet blown in Exodus 19 saying, gather the people together to receive information. The last trump saying, let's get out of here, wrath's coming. So how do we escape the tribulation? Be born again. Be born again. When Jesus was telling his disciples all about the tribulation, at the end of it, this is what he said in Luke 21, 36. He said, Watch you therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. There's only one way you could be accounted worthy to escape the tribulation, and that is to be a child of God, born again, born of the Spirit. Verse 54, he says, And so when the corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of the sin is the law, because we can't keep it. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Can you applaud the Lord for that? That is so awesome. You know, and you know what I love about Paul right here? He's got a sense of humor, right? He's a funny guy. Anybody here play hoops, shoot baskets, or, or you know, I guess you could say anything, golf, ping pong, anything like that. Do you guys ever get with your buddies and you start trash talking each other? <clears throat> it's kind of fun, right? You're kind of like, oh, dude, you're going down. You're going down. Oh, come on, hit it, Susan, right? I mean, you know, you just start trash talking your friends. Paul's doing some spiritual trash talking right here. I mean, look at what he says. He says, oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? It's like he's parading around in a graveyard going, you got nothing on me. Where's your sting now? Yeah, what? Where's your victory? And that's you and me. Our victory is in Jesus, but thanks be to God who has given us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This place is not our home. We are out of here. Finish and finish well. Because he's worth it. Death does not have a sting on you. Death does, does not have victory over you. You know, there was a story of a, a family driving across country Got the whole family, got mom and dad in the front, the kids are all in the back, they got the windows down, they're having a great old time, driving across country, and all of a sudden a bee flies into the car, starts going all around the car, kids start freaking out, because one of the little girls in the back was deathly allergic to bees and could die from a bee sting. So there's this panic going on, and everybody's trying to swat it and bat it, and all of a sudden the father driving grabs it, and it has it in his hand, and crushes his hand. And everybody settles down. And then he opens up his hand, and the bee flies out and starts buzzing around. Everybody starts freaking out again. And he goes, wait, 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 relax. Take it easy. Look. The stinger's in my hand. He can't hurt you anymore. He can only buzz around you and mess with you. That's what God's saying about the devil to you. He can't hurt you anymore. He can only buzz around you and mess with you because 
He can't take your life because your life is in Christ Jesus. Verse 58, therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Whatever you do for Jesus is not in vain. We are here for a purpose, and when our calling is completed, God will take us home. And so my encouragement to you today is to finish well, answer the call. It's not about the results that you see in your ministry. It's about you being obedient and doing your calling. God gets the results, not you anyway. It's important for us to understand that. Just do what the master's asking you to do. Your labor is not in vain. So when is Jesus coming? No man knows the hour of the day, but we do know the season. Jesus is coming when you start to see a push for a one-world rule. Jesus is coming when you start to see nations collapsing. Jesus is coming when you see lawlessness run rampant, when you see natural disasters like a woman travailing in birth coming more and more frequent and more and more powerful, when you see nations rise up against nations, You know, that word nations in the Greek is ethnos. It's ethnos. You know what it means? When you see ethnic groups rising up against ethnic groups. When you see diseases begin to take over radically. When you see evil spoken of good and good is spoken of evil, look up. Your redemption draws nigh. Let me close with this. Work for the Lord. Your labor is not in vain. Don't be like the Corinthians. Work for the Lord. Serve the Lord. Give to the Lord. Go above and beyond for the Lord. Love one another. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Obey the Lord. Forgive others. Answer your calling. Finish well. And the only way you're going to do that is to die daily is to present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Die daily. Stay on that altar. Why? Because he's worth it. Let's pray. Lord God, we um, praise you for our eternal life. Thank you that you even saw fit to die for a wretch like me. And so, Lord, we just pray with all of our heart that you would help us to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to finish and finish well and to be a light that shines for your glory. Lord, use us to love on the people in this North Shore, to reach out and to lead people to your feet, to see the captives set free to share what we have and not be satisfied that we know where we're going, everybody else is on their own, but to have an attitude of just, I want everyone to be saved. Lord, you have to put that drive in our heart because it's not natural. And so we ask that you would empower us with your love, your grace, and your mercy. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, Would you just acknowledge right now in your heart, say, Lord, I'm a sinner, forgive me. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and were buried and rose again on the third day. Save me now. If you just prayed that in your heart, you're a child of God. Now go out and live for him because he's coming soon. Lord, give us strength and power like we've never had before. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you guys.